but uh, welcome everyone tonight. My name is uh, uh, Karen Marcinkiu and I'm Program Manager with the Alzheimer Society. And I welcome you to our evening of education presentation tonight. It is on mental health and support for caregivers along the caregiver, uh, along the dementia journey. And we have three wonderful guest presenters tonight. We have Michelle Buglis. She's a registered social worker and counselor. We have Patty Sean, she's a care partner, and Tim Halbrook, he's a care partner as well. Um, as we gather here virtually today, I want to first of all acknowledge that I am joining you from Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. The people of the Alzheimer's Saskatchewan are privileged to live and work across the traditionally sacred land we now know as Saskatchewan. We recognize the legacy and enduring presence of the Cree, Dakota, Dene, Nakota, Lakota, Soto, and Métis people who are the original stewards of the rolling hills, rushing rivers, and living sky we all share today. And as an organization, we acknowledge the harms of the past and how Indigenous people are still impacted by the process of colonialism. Through education, partnerships, and collective action, we commit to honoring our relationship with the land, our treaties, and each other as we journey towards Wakota Hisawin, which is reconciliation in Cree. So before we begin, I'd like to take care of a few housekeeping items. Thank you to our supporting sponsors, Fastel Telcare and SGI. The presentation tonight will be recorded. Um, please know that only the presenters are being shown on the screen and as participants, your faces and your names will not be shown on the screen and you will all be muted. Um, following tonight, an email will be sent to you with a short participant evaluation survey, the PowerPoint slide deck of Michelle's presentation and links to education resources. And during the presentation, we welcome you to type your questions into the Q&A box, which you should see at the bottom of your screen, um, and not the chat part, but just the Q&A. Um, we will have a brief question period at the end of the presentation, which is to the group of the presenters, where I will read the questions that have been typed in um, to the presenters. And we ask that you keep your, your questions relevant to the topic being presented tonight and general questions only. Um, not personal ones. The presenters will not be giving personal advice and will not comment on, on your personal situations. Um, so I think moving forward, I want to just welcome again our presenters. We're really happy to have them all tonight. And I'm going to introduce you to each and every one of them. So um, we'll start with Michelle Buglis. She'll be our first presenter tonight. She has over 25 years experience working and teaching in the area of mental health and addictions and in the field of social work. She has worked in long-term care supporting residents living with dementia, as well as offering counseling to individuals with a focus on those over 50, um, living with concerns related to their mental health and overall well-being. Michelle has also been on the personal dementia a caregiver journey with her mom who passed away two years ago with dementia. Patty Sean, is, um, Patty's husband, George, was diagnosed at the age of 69 with Alzheimer's disease in 2015. She has been involved with Alzheimer's Society ever since. George passed away in January of 2022. She and George have five children who are all married and live in Regina. She has 10 grandchildren and one grandson-in-law. Patty is co-facilitator of the Alzheimer's Society Early Stage Group, Early Stage Support Group in Regina, and was a participant in the Virtual Caregiver Support Group for seven and a half years. And last but not least, we have Tim Halbrick. Um, he's a professional engineer and project manager who's originally from Shaunavon in Southwest Saskatchewan. Actually, Hodgeville, he told me. <laughs> so close to Shadowman. There in high school, he met the girl who would eventually become his wife. Saskatoon has been his home since 1979, where he completed all of his education and career. Since 2018, starting in his late 50s, he has been focusing on his family life after his wife was diagnosed with young onset dementia in 2015. 
He's a longstanding participant in the Alzheimer's Society Young Onset Spousal Support Group. So welcome to all of you. And we will start um, with our presenter, Michelle. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. And thank you for that introduction. I, um, I'm not, I'm very used to Zoom. Um, I'm not used to not seeing the participants. So this is a bit uh, unusual for me, but I'm gonna share my screen now to show some of the, the slides that I have. Um, oops, just wait, sorry. Uh, stop share. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Okay. Just need to minimize that. Yeah, and I can hear you. Yourself. Perfect. There we go. Okay, here we go. So thank you again for having me here. I am very happy and honored to be here. And I think Karen's introduction covered anything that I would have said to introduce myself. Um, I feel very fortunate to be able to work in the area of mental health and um, addictions and to have had a very long career in this area. Um, I also have, as Karen mentioned, a personal and professional um, passion for working with and supporting people living with dementia and caregivers, um, as well as just older adults in general. So to be able to combine the two has been a really uh, wonderful gift for me, and and I'm I'm very happy with where I've I've landed. So tonight um, will just be a really hopefully a very comfortable and relaxed um, discussion or or. Um, presentation around mental health and the caregivers. So as Karen mentioned, um, my mom uh, passed away in uh, December, I guess that would be two years ago. Um, and uh, she uh, was on the dementia Alzheimer's journey for a number of years when and we walked with her on that journey. Um, and I feel very, again, fortunate and um, blessed that I was able to be a part of that, that journey with her. I added some little Fred Flintstone uh, pictures to all of my slides just to keep it a little bit lighter, maybe a little less intense. And also because it reminds me of when I was a child and, and growing up in the 70s and the Flintstones were a really big part of, of our time there. So, so this, I, I like to kind of have a little bit of that as well. So that's, that's kind of me in a nutshell. Um, so what I'm going to talk about over the next uh, 30 minutes or so is, um, first of all, the introduction, which we've already done. We're going to touch on what is mental health? What is it? What does that actually mean? Um, uh, mental health or mental well-being, mental illness. We're going to talk about some of the signs to pay attention to. So some of the signs that uh, for caregivers or for all individuals, but in particular, I tried to sort of tailor it to caregivers for this presentation. So what are the things, things we should be looking for? Um, and then once we recognize the signs or see that we might be struggling, how do I address my mental health needs? What, what are some things that I can do about it to help, uh, to help myself when I'm struggling? The next thing we're gonna to touch on is, is when should I seek help? So it's important to recognize that um, sometimes the strategies we we use and we try on our own aren't working and, and maybe it's time to seek help. And sometimes people struggle with that sort of idea around, am I, am, am I feeling sad or am I depressed? And I need to, to seek support and treatment for that. Um, and then resources. And I'll just, there's a slide at the end that shares some pretty common resources across Saskatchewan. I'm in Saskatoon, but I didn't want to have them Saskatoon specific. Uh, so just some common resources that people can access. Uh, and that will kind of wrap things up. So first of all, what is mental health? So mental health includes our emotional, psychological, and social well-being. It affects how we think, feel, and act. And it also helps determine how we handle stress. 
uh, how we relate to others and how and the choices that we make or how we make choices and our decisions in our life. Mental health is important in every stage of life from childhood to adolescence and through adulthood. So just a few stats that I wanted to share with you. By the age of 40, uh, half of Canadians have or have had some kind of mental illness, some type of mental illness. Um, and in any given year, one in five Canadians experience a mental a mental illness. Um, that's just that's not just people who are sort of struggling with their mental well-being, but they actually one in five will experience a mental illness. People with a mental illness are twice as likely to have a substance use disorder compared to the general population. And mental illness and substance use disorders are the leading cause of disability in Canada. So it's a it's a it is a very serious issue. On average, 11 people in Canada die from suicide each day. More than half are people age 45 and older. And another stat I didn't put on there, but I think is is relevant to consider and reflect on is often we think suicide is a um, sort of a, 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 a an issue that young only young people face and maybe adolescents and teens and so on but actually um, men over age 65 have the highest rate of suicide in, or over 75 I'm sorry men over the age of 75 have the highest rate of suicide in Canada so um, depression and struggling with mental illness doesn't end as we age and uh, it's something that that is we experience throughout that continuum of, of life the other thing that's important to consider when we're talking about what is mental health is the stigma part. So a lot of there's still a lot of stigma around um, mental illness and and some of the challenges that we may experience. And oftentimes um, certain populations are are more reluctant to uh, re access help and to ask for supports and so on. Sometimes caregivers can feel really isolated and alone. Um, and can feel as if as if they're the only ones um, that are going through this. And maybe there's a lot of different mixed emotions that might come with that, which can intensify that stigma or that feeling of of I I, I can't ask for help or or um, I shouldn't ask for help. So we want to talk about that and we want to encourage people to be comfortable recognizing when they're struggling and getting the help that they need. So what are the signs to pay attention to? Um, there's a number of signs that, that um, we need to pay attention to when we are thinking about our mental well-being and our, our mental health. So just because a person may experience some of these symptoms doesn't mean, oh my gosh, I have a mental illness because I didn't sleep well last night. That's that's not the case. It's it's more if it's a change in some of these signs. So so I've broken it down into three categories: behavioral, physical, and emotional. So some of the signs to pay attention to around behavioral. Behavioral are things that I'm doing or things that I'm not doing anymore. So things that I'm doing more of or doing less of. So sleep is a big one. Um, not sleeping or sleeping too much, sleeping more than you used to or not getting nearly enough sleep. I know a lot of caregivers often struggle with being able to sleep for a lot of different reasons. Um, change in appetite, uh, not eating properly, um, not, um, not feeling hungry, not, not getting the nutrition that, that you need, not eating um, the healthy foods that you need. Uh, decreased physical exercise is it can be another sort of behavioral symptom to say, hey, I'm not doing as well as I should be. I haven't been getting out. I haven't been walking. I haven't been doing the things that I used to do physically. Neglecting your medical needs. This is a big one too, and, and a really important one. A lot of times people who are, are caregiving um, uh, start to neglect their own medical needs. So maybe you have, um, you should be monitoring your blood pressure because of uh, a heart condition and you, you, um, you kind of are neglecting that and you're not checking as often as you used to because you're, you're busy um, in caregiving. Um, so neglecting those medical needs as well. Uh, neglecting illnesses that, that you have, not taking care of yourself when you're getting sick. 
isolating yourself socially, maybe taking some risks, not taking care of yourself. Um, risk taking could be things like drinking too much or um, doing things that you know, wouldn't have normally done. Increased substance use, decrease in activities that formerly gave you joy, like cooking or crafts or reading. The next category is the physical. So what are some of the physical signs to pay attention to? These could be things like persistent headaches or migraines, a lot of muscle tension and soreness that can come from anxiety, digestive issues, stomach issues, feeling sluggish, and then that fatigue as well. And then emotional uh, is the third category. So that's sort of how, what emotions you're feeling or not feeling, right? Um, so it could be poor mental focus, not being able to focus and concentrate on things, feeling irritable or angry when you never used to sort of feel that way, feelings of anxiety or worry, extreme sadness, hopelessness, and then the thoughts of suicide or loneliness as well. Again, um, almost all caregivers are going to identify some with something on this list, right? We, we all have times in our life where we don't sleep as well, or we're not taking care of ourselves, not exercising as well, where we're having a hard time focusing. Um, but it's when the, these area, these symptoms are prolonged, they're, they're continuing, and they're interfering with our life where in a negative, in a negative way. Um, and, and impacting our life negatively. And it's at that time that we need to pay attention to it and look at um, where we might be out of balance. So a helpful way to kind of look at this is to imagine yourself and your being, your well-being as a balance wheel. So in this slide, I have an example of a very basic balance wheel. But your balance wheel can be what whatever it is for you. So in this one, it talks about social, which could be interacting with family or organizations, clubs, um, friends, etc. Uh, intellectual could be reading, watching a documentary, taking a class, um, doing Sudoku, whatever it is that you enjoy, you know, that sort of stimulates your brain. But for different people, it can be different things. Spiritual might be attending services or being involved in an organization or just prayer at home. Um, so a, a, a wellness wheel, imagine sort of that that it's like a, a wheel that you're rolling along. And if if certain parts of the wheel are, are flatter or are uneven, um, we're not going to roll along very well. Right? We're not going to be able to, to roll through or function in our daily life in the way that we'd like to or that we need to as caregivers if our wheel is out of balance. So after this presentation, I, I, one of the things that I'd like to suggest is that you take, um, you know, take a piece of paper and make a circle and then draw lines through it like a pizza, right? like slices of pizza, maybe six pieces of pizza, and label the areas of your own wellness wheel. What are the things that you need that contribute to your wellness? And then honestly measure from maybe zero to 10 um, how you think you're doing in each of the areas and which area might need a little bit more attention and might need some support. What areas are you, have you kind of let go or have you neglected or that you miss, right? What areas do you wanna work on? And then finding ways to sort of, to sort of, um, expand that that area so that you can have a more well-rounded wheel. All these pieces are interconnected. They all uh, all to get they all work together to create and to help support our overall well-being, which helps support our mental health. So it's really important when one area is neglected, it, it creates an imbalance in all of the other areas. So here's Fred again, Flintstone with a flat. And so this is an example of Fred's out of balance here on, on his balance wheel. Um, a nice way, he, you know, um, he, he won't be able to get to where he needs to go because his wheel is out of balance. Um, he won't be able to uh, meet his emotional needs or maybe the emotional needs of others. He's gonna, he's gonna have a hard time caring for himself or caring for others when he's out of balance like that. So it's just kind of a nice way to reflect on um, your overall well-being 
and looking at taking an honest look at where am I out of balance? Where's something, where's an area that I want to work on with my own mental health? Once you've done that, that sort of pizza with your balance wheel, the next thing you want to ask yourself then is, how, okay, so I recognize that these are some areas that I want to work on and that I'm struggling with. So how do I address my mental health needs? What are some ways that I can address it? So the first way is really connecting with others who are going through a similar situation. And that could be through the Alzheimer's Society or other organizations, um, friends, groups, uh, family members, et cetera. But connecting with people who understand who, who understand the challenges that you're experiencing and some of the struggles that you're having, whether it's related to caregiving or, or something else going on for yourself. Because remember, we talked about one, you know, up to 50% of people will have struggled with a mental illness at some time in their life. So when we're struggling with caregiving and, and, and it's kind of drawing out some of the, the care that we used to give to ourselves, um, it, it can certainly exacerbate some of those um, uh, illnesses or challenges that we, we had had earlier on and that maybe we were managing. So connecting with others who are going through a similar situation. Talking with friends and family about how you're feeling is also very important. A lot of times people think they need to keep it to themselves, not share, um, be strong, but, but sharing what's going on and the feelings that you're having and the challenges that you're having with family and friends is, is very important. It's the only way that they would be able to help. Asking for help. That can also be a really difficult thing um, for people and for caregivers uh, to ask for help. One of the things that I like to, to have a person kind of reflect on is imagine that it was it was your your friend or your family member who was going through a challenge and and what how you would respond if they asked you for help. Most often we would respond positively and we would want to support that person. And and the same goes for individuals who are who are in that space right now where they need the help. Asking for help is such an important thing. Taking time for yourself, just sort of, again, feeding your soul, giving yourself that self-compassion and that self-love in whatever way works for you. Meal planning and prep is another one because proper nutrition and health uh, is such an important part of our overall well-being. Um, again, it's all interconnected. So finding ways to sort of um, have things have meals planned and prepped so that it, it takes one thing off your plate on a daily. You don't have to worry about it that day because you've you've already made your meals for four days or that kind of thing. Talking to your doctor, that's another one, especially again, if you have been or are on any kind of medication for um, a, a mental illness. A lot of people have been on medications or on medications for anxiety, depression, et cetera, um, other mood disorders. And so talking to your doctor, letting them know what's going on for you, what some of the current challenges are, and seeing if there's anything that they need to know um, about your physical health and your mental health and, and in order to treat it. Getting involved in an Alzheimer's support group, super important, lots of wonderful people who can help you out. And that talking to a counselor, if you wanna talk individually with someone. Setting boundaries with people um, and with your for yourself to be able to say it's okay to say no, it's okay to say no, it's time for me. Um, a, a, a yes to you is a yes to me, but a no to you is also a yes to me. So being able to set those boundaries and then practicing self-care. And the important thing to know about self-care is that self-care is not selfish in any way. It's actually essential. Um, if our own cup is is empty, we don't have anything to put into anybody else's cup. Um, so we're going to talk about um, self care next. But self care is is a is a really important thing and something a lot of people find challenging. I, um, if you think about when you go on a plane and if the the oxygen they always tell you if the oxygen masks drop. Um, put yours on first before you put on your child's oxygen mask or the person next to you. And the reason why they say that is because if you aren't, um, if you if you're if you're panicked and if you're not, if if you aren't able to sort of um, breathe and um, uh, think 
properly in, in that moment, you're not going to be able to help the person beside you. That's self-care, right? It's important to take care of ourselves so that we can take care of others. So this slide is just a little uh, picture or an image of what self-care really is. And it's very simple. It doesn't have to be a trip to Costa Rica, which would be lovely, um, but not in the cards for a lot of us. But self-care is just that self-kindness to yourself, being kind to yourself. And it really is the first step in good mental health. Uh, it can be as simple as um, taking uh, a break. In, in this picture, it's got daydreaming, um, going for a walk, uh, enjoying the sun, going out and enjoying the sun on your face, um, taking a warm bath, um, listening to music, whatever it is, any simple pleasures that give you joy and taking those moments to um, to feed yourself and feed your soul uh, is self-care. So another thing I'd like you to do other than that balance wheel and the pizza um, is to take a pen and paper after this presentation and maybe write down some of your self-care strategies. What are the things that you do for your own self-care and your own well-being? What are some things, and you know, try to come up with 10 or even 20 things, things that you enjoy doing, things that, that feel good for you, that bring you joy. And when you're, when you're feeling sort of, when you're feeling stuck or when you're starting to feel like um, you need to take care of yourself and your mental health, pull out the list and 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 put it on your to-do list, one of those simple things. Um, it, it's those simple daily, it can feel like um, it's unmanageable, but if we just do a tiny little thing to again, feed ourselves each day, it can sort of help ground us and help us get through those challenging times. So sometimes uh, self-care isn't enough. Sometimes, again, we have um, pre-existing mental health conditions that are exacerbated when we are worn down and when we're tired and when we are stressed and et cetera. Um, sometimes we've tried all, a lot of the self-care strategies and it's just, it's just not enough. We need to do something more. Then it's time to seek help. So when to seek help? You may want to seek help if you find that you're worrying more than usual. Um, you may be a worrier, but if your worrying is, is so intense um, that it's, it's affecting all those other parts of your balance wheel, right? It's affecting your sleep. It's affecting your relationships. It's, it's affecting all aspects of your life. You may want to seek help if you're finding it hard to enjoy life, if you simply are feeling that sort of the, a numbness inside where you're not finding joy anymore. You may want to seek help if you're having thoughts and feelings that are difficult to cope with, um, like uh, thoughts of, of self-harm or, or suicide or, or thoughts of um, kind of, you know, like giving up. Right. And 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 or or even thoughts that are related to anger and frustration. Right. If you're feeling very angry and um, uh, annoyed a lot of the time, frustrated, etc. If you're having thoughts and feelings that are difficult to cope with is you might want to seek help. Again, if you're having thoughts of self-harm or suicide, which I, I mentioned, and the most important thing is if these thoughts and feelings are interfering um, with your day-to-day -day life to a point where you aren't able to function the way that you want to function, and it and it's it's affecting how you feel inside about yourself and how you feel about the people around you. So the last slide here uh, is Wilma calling on some resources. So so. These are pretty general resources that aren't, some are specific to caregivers, but others are more general resources. Um, these slides will be available, uh, so I won't go through all of the, the different um, phone numbers, but there are a variety of, of um, in-person supports, counseling, there's virtual, there's uh, phone supports where you can call. There's 24 hour. The very first one is a 
24 hour health and mental health um, support line, um, uh, um, Canadian Mental Health Association offers a variety of services. And then again, the, the um, Alzheimer's Society of Society Alzheimer's Society of Saskatchewan. I also included the You Are Caregiver app. Uh, I remember, I actually think I was in the study a couple years ago or a year ago when she was first um, interviewing people for the app, but I saw it on the news the other day and I saw that it's up and running and I downloaded it. And it's beautiful. It's a beautiful resource app uh, for caregivers of people living with dementia to help support your overall mental health and well-being. So just knowing that there's a lot of resources out there, there's a lot of supports, you're not alone, and taking care of yourself isn't selfish, it's it's essential um, in order to for you to be able to be the caregiver that you want to be and and to to be the the best um, you know parent, grandparent, partner, daughter, whatever it is that, that you can be. And uh, taking care of your mental health is, is incredibly important. So that's my last slide. I, I, I think my last slide has questions or comments, but we're going to leave that, I think, till the end. So um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and just want to thank you all for, um, for allowing me to share some of my my per my thoughts and and um and information with you so thank you thank you very much michelle for presenting to us tonight now we will have patty sean present to you thanks patty hi <clears throat> well a lot of what uh michelle said is um is what kind of is going to come up in in my uh, uh presentation here um, when George was diagnosed in um, June of 2015, um, I'm a person who, who likes knowledge. I want to know what's going on. And so um, I very quickly called the Alzheimer's Society and uh, we took the, um, the first steps program. Um, at that time, it was offered in person. It was um, a series of uh, six weeks where we met for an hour, an hour and a half, I can't remember what it was, but went through different aspects of the disease and, and that sort of thing. And the last one was um, an introduction to support groups, both for the for George and, and for myself, the caregiver. And that to me was one of the greatest coping mechanisms and um, a lifesaver for me. Um, we both began going to the to the different support groups right away. Um, we became it, it was in person at that time, and we became good friends. Many of us, in fact, there's still some of us who get together uh, once a month for coffee. There's another group of us that gets together every once in a while to go out for lunch or whatever. Um, it, it's just, as Michelle talked about, you need people who understand what you're going through. And you're in a group where you've got people who are caregiving at different stages of the disease. They understand where you're at. Um, they offer you support that someone not on the journey doesn't really understand. Um, they give you a little push sometimes because um, I know I was wondering at one point if, you know, if I should be considering a day program for George and, and, um, they were very supportive in different ones in the group who had people in support group or in um, day programs and such like. So above all, it's important, I think, to, to be in a group like that, to feel that support. And if nothing else, it gets you out once a month um, into a social atmosphere 
Um, and, and, and in fact, I came to the point of really looking forward to it. Um, you'd often the last week or so before it was time to go, um, it was like, oh, I just can't wait. And, and there's this and this I want to talk about. <laughs> and, and, um, so, so that was tremendously helpful. From support group, it led on to the Minds in Motion program, uh, which George and I took part in from the, from the very beginning as well. Um, this was an exercise program uh, where there would be 45 minutes of exercise and then 45 minutes of, uh, of an activity. Um, at that time, this was pre-COVID, so it was all in person, which was lovely. Um, and then it, it gave both of us exercise, which is a very good coping mechanism as well, and, and the social aspect of it. So it, it was a, another great way to, to get us out and to get you among people who understand what's going on. Um, another um, coping mechanism of mine was to um, call here in, in Regina, it was called SWAD, S-W-A-D-D, System-Wide Admission and Discharge. Um, I don't remember what it's called in Saskatoon, but um, again, where people, a, um, a social worker comes out, does an assessment and can, can get um, the person into a day program. Another wonderful, wonderful <laughs> um, opportunity. I remember the first time I took George and, and dropped him off. And just the weight that I felt go off my shoulders to know that, that he was in a place where he was safe, he was going to be taken care of, and he was going to have activities. And then to go and pick him up and to meet him with a smile, a big smile on his face was just meant everything to me. And so that, that really um, took a lot of weight off of me. It gave me from nine o'clock in the morning till four o'clock in the afternoon to do what I wanted to do. If I just wanted to go home and have a nap, <laughs> that was great. Um, uh, just time that that was mine, that that I was not on duty kind of thing. Um, self care. Michelle talked about self care with the day program and with George being looked after for that time. That gave me time to sort of recharge my batteries. Um, go for a massage, go for a walk, like I said, have a nap, um, go and have tea with my sister, um, all of those kind of things that, that just kind of help you say, okay, I'm, I'm ready to, to take this on again. I'm, I'm ready to, to carry on. Um, another very important thing that I found in uh, coping with the disease was to have someone you can vent to. Um, it, it, it wasn't really my children that I wanted to vent to, because um, after all, the, this is their dad. I mean, they're watching him progress through the disease and, and it's, it's traumatic for them too. I mean, sure, they're all adults, but still. Um, and my, I had two people actually. My two people were two of my sisters. I could phone either one of them and be a blubbering mess. And they would listen and, and give me a little bit of a pep talk maybe, but I think it's very important that you have somebody that you can go to and or call or whatever and, and they will just listen. They may 
they don't even have to offer any advice. They just they just need to listen sometimes. You just need to be able to to talk it all out or to spill it all out. Um, and of course, as Michelle mentioned too, talk to your doctor. Um, I I was on a bit of a bit of bit of a bit of a medication for depression and whatever. Um, still, I'm on a very small dose, but sometimes you just have to admit that you need some help. I know it took me a while to admit it. And uh, finally, my doctor said, you know, you, you really need to do this um, for you to be able to take care of George and, and to do a good job of it and, and you know, to, to live life. Um, it would really help. And, and so finally, I gave in. And again, you find out after that, that yes, this was a good idea. So, so do talk to your doctor. Get out get some exercise, take a walk. Um, there's lots of um, different apps that that have exercise routines uh, that, that you can follow. Um, take some respite time. I know I, I did at one point get away for, for uh, um, about a week and George went into respite and, and my children were kind of in charge and um, things didn't go exactly the way we had hoped they would, but, but they kept all that to themselves. And, and so I was kind of able to enjoy my time away. So you have to lean on people and you have to, as Michelle said too, ask for help because they, they are willing to help but sometimes they're not sure if they should just jump in and and, uh, and offer at the time. For me also, um, prayer is very important. Uh, my faith is very important. Um, George and I were both people of faith and um, having a higher power to turn to uh, it is was very helpful for me um, and still is as I as I grieve his loss. So um, it's I know it's not for everybody, but for me, uh, prayer, some meditation um, really helped me to to get through my days. Um, I think lastly, I would like to say, um, forgive yourself because there are going to be days when things don't go well at all. <laughs> um, I remember one particular day where I was a, a crying, screaming mess and it was with George. And you have to forgive yourself. Forgive yourself that you're not perfect and move on and kind of pull up your socks and, and, uh, and carry on because uh, nobody's going to do this absolutely perfectly. Um, we all do the best we can. We, we love the person that we're caring for. And we, we do the best we can to take care of them. And, and while doing that, to also take care of ourselves so that we will continue to be there for them. So I think that's, that's all I have to say for now. Thank you. Patty, thank you so much for sharing your personal story and ideas and, and thoughts and, and tips for people. We really appreciate it. So now we'll move on to Tim, Tim Caldrick. Thank you, Tim. Okay, thank you, Karen. And thank you to the Alzheimer's Society for uh, giving me a chance to you know, share some thoughts and uh, observations, I guess. And uh, I hope some of you, you know, find them you know, interesting, maybe useful. So in my, 
a few minutes here, I guess I was just going to kind of introduce you to myself again and uh, my situation. Talk a bit about what I thought initially when we started the journey. And then probably some observations as far as what eroded my resilience and my confidence. How I helped myself, what external help I got, what I've learned about you know, my experience so far, learn from my experience so far, and perhaps, you know, a couple of the bigger lessons, I guess. So essentially, I'm a middle-aged husband and an engineer, you know, and that's probably the worst combination because I think I know everything and I think I can fix anything. So my wife and I are in our early 30s and we've been, or early 60s, and we've been married for 40 of those 60 years. My wife has been on her young onset dementia journey for 10 years, and I've been at home uh, full-time caregiving for six of those 10 years. <clears throat> and, at that, and, and, and throughout that time, I've been focusing on really keeping her he happy, healthy, safe, and successful. That's kind of been my mantra. Uh, we have two uh, adult sons who are close here, and uh, we're, we're really lucky for that, and they've helped a lot. And we live in Saskatoon where there's a lot of external support. And I'm, you know, thankful, uh, thankful for that as well. So that's a little bit more about our, about myself, I guess, and our situation. So what I thought initially, you know, initially I said, hey, I'm a man. I got this. Get on my shoulders and I'll carry us to the promised land. You know, I really felt I was resilient and confident. And I really didn't need any help to get through this, you know, challenge that was you know, given to our family. <clears throat> I thought that my faith and my positive attitude would, you know, get me through all the rough times and and we would get through this one just like other challenges. And I, initially I, I felt I really didn't need to join a group or see an external counselor. I really didn't need any help. So, you know, really it turns out that all of those things are were wrong. So, you know, ultimately, I, I guess I don't know everything. So thinking back, these are some of the things that I guess eroded my resilience and my confidence. <clears throat> uh, the first thing, I guess, was a constant feeling of being on duty, on point, on call, and, you know, sometimes trapped by the situation. You know, there were regular feelings of, Remorse, you know, remorse over what my wife was losing, obviously. Uh, remorse over what I was losing and giving up, you know, after leaving the workforce. Um, and then as well, what we were losing as a, as a couple who expected to, you know, live together for a long and happy life. I had regular thoughts of my wife's end and her funeral. Uh, sometimes that's unavoidable, but anyways, I had... I had thoughts of her end time and her funeral. I had regular feelings of, of guilt. So guilt for not doing more or after the fact, not doing things differently or better. <clears throat> and then there was another kind of guilt after I thought about it that, that really aided me. And that was sort of a moral guilt. And that is having to constantly fib to or lie to or deceive your wife. To move things along and, and those of you who have experience know that it's the nature of the beast you have to do these things to move things along but it does present a a, a moral dilemma and, and a feeling of guilt that you have to do these things to somebody that you've never lied to or fibbed to before <clears throat> i had spurts of anger and outbursts that i think were atypical and uh, that i regretted after the fact I had a flatness in my own feelings. And as one example, when my mother passed away, I was kind of ho-hum about it. And I thought, you know, I, I, I kind of thought, well, this isn't right. I should be, I should be feeling differently. I did see, you know, less energy or enjoyment in, in, in my hobbies. <clears throat> I had less concern for my physical health and I delayed doctor's visits and I skipped the gym and, and all those things. Um, and for the first time, I, I probably had some recurring sleep issues you know everybody has sleep issues but i i had you know periods where i had difficulty sleeping and it was worrisome 
And, uh, you know, again, w w waking up in the middle of the night and not being able to get back to sleep again because you're worrying or, or, or you have anxiety about almost anything. <clears throat> I also found that I was relying more on, you know, in quotes, self-medication. So, yeah, you know, I was, I was using some bad habits to feel, you know, better in the moment, knowing that that, that wasn't the best for me. So those are sort of the things, I guess, that, you know, I saw eroded my, my resilience and my confidence and started to make me feel a little less uh, confident in the future. So, I, you know, and I knew that this can happen to, to caregivers, you know, through my, through my experience and that. And um, so these are some of the things I did to help myself. And no, I didn't see uh, Michelle's slides beforehand. This is stuff that, re that, that really, uh, in retrospect, I did for myself. So I did stick to my faith, um, like uh, Patty did. And I, I did stay positive and I used humor and music whenever I could. But, but that's me and I'm, I'm not gonna change. Those are things that are essential to being, to being me and they did help me feel better. For me, I, I learned everything about the disease and caregiving I could. I, for me, I found that knowledge was power and it helped reduce my stress, you know, and, and fear of the future and uncertainty in the future. I also changed to, to living week to week, day to day. Until you've done it, you probably don't understand what that means, but it means like, and it was difficult to do, but you just can't worry about the future because of the things that you can't change or you can't predict. So I ended up really trying to live week to week, day to day, being happy with what happened um, in, a, in the very short term. And, term. and it, it really meant that I, you know, I trusted that everything would be okay or at least manageable in the future. And it was difficult for me to do as somebody who likes to really you know, plan ahead. I also raised the priority of my own health. Eventually I said, you know, you, you've, got to, you've, got, you've got to do something to improve your physical, physical uh, well-being. So I pushed myself to do the regular exercise, even when it was difficult to arrange. <clears throat> um, you know, and I booked my doctors and dentist visits and I, and I, and I did attend them. And I, I made the time and took the effort to do that and, and arrange, arrange backup so that I could actually do it. I got control of my bad habits as, as I should have. I did learn some techniques uh, about sleep and how to, how to maximize your sleep and get back to sleep. I never needed those techniques before, but I found that I found them very useful. I had to find new enjoyable things to do with my wife. So as her ca capabilities changed and her capacity changed, we, you know, we had to adapt. We had to find different things that we could do together together. Um, you know, to enjoy being together. And, um, and it, re it required adaptation and required effort. I also reached out to others uh, and, and helped other people solve their problems. Um, it just, it gave me a feeling of value. So yeah, I did, I did reach out and, and, you know, try and be compassionate and understand the big and the small problems that people uh, had uh, around me that, that I could help with, you know, a neighbor, a family member, a friend. And, and that, uh, that did help. That helped me stay connected and, and gave me a feeling of value. The other thing I think was important was I regularly reminded myself of the good things that have happened as a result of this journey. Uh, because there are good things. And, 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 I, and I, I did have to materialize those in my head and in my mind. And I'll give you three examples. So, you know, without a doubt, I have had more quality time with my wife, you know, enjoying life in the now. Uh, if I was work, I'm, you know, you, you know, you have to split, you have to split your time and attention. And so I've had more quality time. Another good thing was I found new skills and strength in myself that I thought I had, but you know, I was able to demonstrate those and prove to myself that I actually had these skills and strengths. Uh, and so that was a good thing. I also, you know, take pride in the fact I'm kind of showing my sons how to face a difficult challenge and, and survive and thrive. So, you know, those are, those are the good things. And I had to materialize them in my head and remind myself about them as a balance to the things that we were losing. Um, finally, uh, you know, 
as difficult as it was sometimes, I did take time off from caregiving. And sometimes it initially it wasn't very much time at all because you're really on duty all the time and you're the only person that can provide the care that's required. But I was able to take the effort and and often it took money and it took courage to let somebody else do what I thought I was the only person to do. But I did take time off from caregiving and it uh, it has grown over time how much time I was able to take off. So, you know, those are the things that I did to help myself and they did help, absolutely did help. But I found that, you know, I also needed assistance outside of myself and my own abilities. And so these are these are some of the things that, that I guess I, I drew on outside, you know, outside of externally. <clears throat> so I did contact the Alzheimer's Society, didn't know them from a hole in the ground, didn't even know how to spell Alzheimer's initially. But I contacted them and, uh, and I, I found immediately a, just a wealth of resources online that I could review, you know, discreetly. And um, the, uh, just a many, many pleasant and knowledgeable people always there willing to, you know, lend an ear, offer advice, point you in this direction or that direction. And, and the other thing I found about the Ulster Society is that they're there for the whole, the whole journey. You know, fr friends and family will come and go, and uh, but they're there the whole time, and as as and and that I found that to be very very useful. The other thing they did is they started a young onset spousal support group, and I was lucky enough that they did that during my journey, and that I was able to be a charter member of that. And um, you know, it's for spouses in 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 the fifties and sixties, and. Um, you know, with the, with the challenges of, of dementia in that, in that stage of life. And I've gained lots of knowledge and, and experience and, and got to know, uh, you know, laugh with and, and cry with and, and, you know, complain to, you know, people, a bunch of people who can relate. They, they, they walk the walk, they live, they, they live the life that I live. And um, so that was great. Outside of the, the support group, I, I found myself, you know, identifying a lots of other caregivers that were out there in similar situations, some of them well, you know, you know, with things under control and other people floundering. And I, I was able to connect to a number of people. And uh, if nothing else, misery loves company. No, uh, but, you know, no, it was, it was, again, another community individuals that I could uh, call on to share experience and knowledge and, and gain allies and, um, you know, compatriots. I did see an external counselor using workplace insurance. You know, there's no silver bullets, but um, it was a good unbiased ear, um, not clouded with emotions or personal connections. They, they, they were able to listen, um, offer advice, make some observations. I, I can appreciate that. I've been recommending to people throughout my whole life, you know, go see a counselor, um, and so I took my own advice and yeah, it was, it was useful to see somebody and, and talk to an arm's length third party um, expert. I also got my doctor to be honest about my health. Actually, he was honest all the time, but I finally started listening to him. So, uh, you know, I had rose colored glasses and he was able to, he was able to, you know, point at the parameters on, on uh, you know, on the data sheet and say, look, this is not good, Tim. This is not going to serve you well into the future. You've got to get this corrected. So I did start listening to him and, uh, and uh, you know, I'm glad I did. So, so again, those, that's what I did for myself. Those are some of the external resources I drew on. So what have I learned on, you know, learned in my experience so far on this journey? And it's, it's, uh, it's not over yet for us. Um, you know, so I thought I would share a little bit about that. So, you know, I had to accept that it's a very long road with ups and downs that I can't control. That's bottom line. It's uh, there's going to be accidents. There's going to be things. Oopses. There's going to be things that I absolutely could not control. And it, and it, and I have to say it drove me nuts, but I had to accept that that's the way it is. And it's going to be a long, long road. I, I, you know, with the people that I met though, I saw that it was a road that has humbled many strong people, many, many strong people. And, to a person, they've all survived and many have thrived in this situation. So in dealing and meeting these other people at different phases in the journey, 
uh, you know, it started to give me confidence and, and, and more hope in the future. You know, I, I also learned that I, I'm glad that I maintained my faith and my hope and my positive attitude and my sense of humor. And, you know, they, they were essential. Uh, they're essential. They're me. And, uh, you know, they have helped me, you know, because I was able to maintain that and um, not roll up in a fetal position and, you know, hide, the, hide in a dark room. I, I, I maintained those things and they were essential to my well-being. I also learned that I'm going to have constant reminders of my losses. They're always in your face. So, you know, you know I'm going to have constantly be constantly reminded of what, uh, you know, I'm losing, what we're losing, what my wife is losing. But, you know, the only thing you can do is just try hard to accept them. And that's that's what I've been able to do. I, I, I also learned that I will have no reminders of what I've gained. So I've told you some of the things I gained. But I have never had reminders of those things. So you ha I have to try real hard to see them and balance out the losses. The good things are there. <clears throat> um, I did know, I do know now that my mental and physical health are definitely affected beyond my control. Both have been impacted by, by this journey, by this situation, by this challenge, uh, you know, for our family. My physical health, you know, was essential to my mental well-being. And so I had to stay fit, eat well, sleep, control my bad habits. All, all those good things, I had to do that to keep my, my brain and my psyche uh, on track. I learned that I was able to help myself, but I found external, external support was essential to my success. And, you know, we're doing okay. But, you know, and I, again, I think you, you've heard this before, family and friends are, you know, they're best for emotional support and listening when they can, they have their limits and what they can do. But the advice from family and friends, you know, I find often when they're affected by the feelings and the emotions, you know, when you're describing a problem, they're looking at your, your body language and probably feeling your pain. And so the advice that they give is not, it's tainted by, by, by their feelings and their, their own emotions. Whereas external supports were, were really good for consultation, advice, and solving real problems on, you know, in my life, like real, real things I was having difficulty with. That's, that's where the external supports came in, I found. They were arm's length, and they were unbiased, and they were to the point. They, were, they had a direct experience with multiple scenarios. You know, I only have experience with my life, and, and, and these... Uh, these external sources have, you know, interactions with, with multiple, multiple different scenarios. So I found that they gave me applicable inf information and they answered questions quickly. And then ultimately they helped me solve problems and better yet avert problems for the future. So, so again, you know, I, again, I, I was able to do some things for myself to keep me on track, but I did require, and I don't regret, you know, reaching out and getting some external help. Um, so just in conclusion, I guess there's a couple of, I guess, maybe the bigger lessons. You know, I learned that, like, I'm really useless to my loved ones if I'm mentally or physically weak or ill or worse in the hospital. I'm, I'm of use to nobody if that's the case. And these things do happen to caregivers. They do get ill. They do end up in the hospital. And so anyways, I learned that lesson. And so really an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And so, you know, really do something for your health, health, even if it takes effort, time and money. And it always takes effort, initiative, and it always takes time and it always takes money to do something, but but is well worth it. And and I guess another another lesson is doing something for your health takes a lot of effort and time and money nowadays that's what it that's that's the bottom line it does take initiative effort time and money but doing nothing for your health and living with the stress takes effort too in lost sleep you know uh re, you know recovering from accidents and and so on it, it it's it's as much emotional effort to do nothing more more emotional effort than it is to actually you know, take the initiative and, and do something for your health. So, um, you know, 
you'll expend more energy and resources if you do nothing to improve your health. So do something, I guess. Okay, so that's all. Thank you, Karen. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Tim. And thank you, all three of you. Wow, that was just really powerful to hear. Um, your experiences and knowledge and advice that you have for uh, caregivers um, and managing mental health and physical health. So I appreciate all of you sharing sharing tonight. Um, so right now, for, for those of you that are, we want you to still stay. We've got these wonderful presenters here for, for a little bit longer. We're gonna have a question and answer period in a few minutes. So have a quick stretch, but also come back because I'm going to show you a few slides from the Alzheimer's Society while you're thinking of questions that you can type into the Q&A box. And then I will ask the questions of the presenters um, following my little presentation here. So um, I'm just going to take a minute to screen share, which sometimes takes me uh, a second, and then uh, we'll just do a few slides. Okay, so here we go. We are, um, I will do a few slides about the Alzheimer's Society while you're typing in your questions. So that, that'll be great. Um, so I want to tell you about the Alzheimer's Society a little bit more. It's the province's leading dementia care and research charity. Um, and the vision of the Alzheimer's Society is to live in a world without Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. And the mission is to empower all people to live well with dementia while funding research into prevention, cures, and quality of life through advocacy and awareness. We are accredited by Imagine Canada Standards Program for excellence in nonprofit accountability, transparency, and governance. And a couple of things to note. A person does not need a formal diagnosis to be connected with us. Um, we support those affected by Alzheimer's disease, but also all, all other types of dementias, and we have resources and knowledge about many types of dementias. I'll just see if the slide's going to move here. <laughs> Not seem to be moving for me. There we go. Perfect. Okay. <clears throat> what can clients expect from the Alzheimer's Society of Saskatchewan? Individualized connection and support. Uh, we have individual information and support available for both people living with dementia and their care partners. Learning opportunities. And that was mentioned earlier by Patty. There's different learning series courses to help people with dementia, their families and friends to live as well as possible with the disease. And the courses offered build upon one another, um, covering the continuum of the disease. Um, and we have virtual and in-person options for those. We have evenings of education such as tonight that we often about, offer about three times a year on certain um, certain standalone topics presented by content, content experts. There's other things as mentioned as well tonight as um, we have support groups. And so you've heard lots about those tonight and, and what they can offer you. We have a Minds in Motion program too that Patty had mentioned. It's a two hour weekly program that combines physical activity and social activity for those with early stage dementia and a friend, family member or care partner. Uh, connection to other organizations. This includes providing information on available services provided by SHA, um, the other government agencies, and lists of private or community-based organizations that help support people's dementia journey. Our shift to also offering virtual and online programming has increased our ability to provide different programs to our communities. And You'll see on the screen there, if you have any questions about dementia or need someone to talk to, you can call our province-wide toll-free dementia helpline phone number listed above. And 
from Monday to Friday, we um, Monday to Friday from 8.30 to 4.30 p.m. Let's talk briefly about dementia research. The keys to progress lie in investing in dementia research, revealing the mysteries of the diseases that cause dementia and advancing diagnosis, treatment and prevention. All research stimulates hope for the best life. The Alzheimer's Society of Saskatchewan funds research in partnership with Alzheimer's societies across Canada through the Alzheimer's Society Research Program. Did you know that three out of every $4 the Alzheimer's Society of Saskatchewan receives comes from donations? Donations inspire hope to provide early diagnosis, greater awareness for new medications and treatments to provide strategies for coping, provide care partners the confidence in their abilities, and to continue to serve Saskatchewan communities with support and resources that are reflective of your needs. Donations come in during events as sponsorships, gifts less than wills, monthly donations, or as general donations to the society. With Alzheimer's Society resource centers across Saskatchewan, in the 2022-2023 fiscal year, we serve close to 2,700 clients from 300 different Saskatchewan communities. And we have Alzheimer's Society resource centers supporting the following former health regions. So there's Cypress, that's serving Swift Current in Southwest Saskatchewan. We have one in Prairie North, that's serving Battlefords and Northwest Saskatchewan. Prince Albert Parkland, serving Prince Albert in Northeast Saskatchewan. Regina Coppell, that's serving Regina, Mooseman and surrounding areas. Saskatoon, serving Saskatoon, Humboldt and surrounding areas. Sun Country, serving Weyburn, Estevan and Southeast Saskatchewan. And then Sunrise, serving Yorkton and East Central Saskatchewan. If you have any questions, again, you can contact the Dementia Helpline and the information is there. So the phone number is there. And also on this slide, there is the email address too. So before we get to questions, I just wanted to tell you a little bit more. You can check out our Alzheimer's Society website for more information. Um, to find out what programs and events we have upcoming, you can scroll down to the programs and events area. And um, again, don't hesitate to call us or email us. And there's our dementia helpline information again. 